Hello, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this esteemed gathering. I must say that yesterday and today has been incredibly interesting. I don't think we've ever had a, such a diverse a lot of people gathered here in South Africa to discuss all of these really important issues. <clears throat> My name is Myrtle Clark, and I'm here representing Fields of Green for All, cannabis legalization nonprofit company. I'm afraid I have to beg to differ with Marius. I'm incredibly positive about drug policy in South Africa, and um, I'm incredibly, incredibly positive about the progress that we're making with cannabis legalization. To put, uh, to put this, is this my working problem? Yeah, it sounds weird, okay. To put this talk into context, these are some of the day-to-day -day issues we deal with in our quest to legalize the most researched plant on the planet. I put forced crop eradication at the top of the list because um, this is a major issue that we're dealing with right now, and I'm going to be speaking about that um, in a bit more detail. Equality for everybody under the law is really important. We've gone through all of the harms of prohibition, and to provide access for people who are, are uh, arrested on cannabis charges is a major part of what we do, because most people are ignorant of their rights under the law and not aware that we are all equal under the law. So people often come to our, our organization for help when they're arrested, and that certainly takes up quite a lot of our time. Educating people and reducing the stigma, there's been a lot of talk about that at this, at this conference, the reducing of stigma, it's obviously something that we do in our work. The preparation for what we're calling the trial of the plant, and that's the thing that keeps us the second most busy at the moment after the forced crop eradication, and I'll be dealing with that in a bit of detail. The harms of prohibition, and I think that those have been extensively covered this evening already. One has to pay the rent and feed the family, as it were, and most of our fundraising is done through events. Cannabis legalization is not exactly the most funded thing in the world. It's either a no-go area for some funders, or it's an area that has already been dealt with. Because there are certain areas around the world that have already legalized cannabis, cannabis has kind of slipped down the priority list for funders. So our organization is largely self-funded through events that we hold for the cannabis community in South Africa. And we're really proud of the fact that we've been generating enough funds on our own for the last five years to have made the progress that we've made and to be standing in front of you today. So that's also something that we do. Formulating future policy and engagement with lawmakers is something that we haven't really done much of until now. And the rest of, uh, the rest of my talk will, will tell you what we've done so far, but it might just become something that keeps us very busy in the future. But we don't really know what the future holds in terms of policy, so our strategy is just to do the best that we can and to engage with as many people as we possibly can and learn along the way what the best way is to deal with issues of drug policy. So cannabis has been grown on the, on the south, uh, eastern coast of, south, of southern Africa for at least the last 500 years. And isn't this just a beautiful plant? So I want you to bear in mind this incredibly beautiful field that we took a photograph of in the Eastern Cape. Just remember this image in your mind. For the last 16 years, South African Police Service has conducted a regular program of forced eradication of cannabis plants. We would like to emphasize that this practice started in the year 2000, six years into our young democracy. This is not the actions of the apartheid government. This is ac the actions of our new democratic government. The following are the most disturbing issues we discovered when we visiting a remote rural area in the Eastern Cape province in early 2015. 
And if you look on the Dhaka Capital's YouTube channel, you'll see a short video called Police in Helicopters. And that is the documentary evidence from, from our little visit. The areas targeted for spraying are in pristine rural areas renowned for their unique biodiversity. Anybody who has ever been to what was formerly known as the Transkai, the Ponderland region, will know how unique the biodiversity is there. The spraying happens within four weeks of the cannabis crops being ready to harvest. The spraying is indiscriminate with no regard to food crops, homesteads, livestock, river courses, or people. Spraying is ex executed with small helicopters that are able to fly very low over the affected areas, low enough for the pilots to laugh at the people as they are disgorging their poison. I know this might seem like a funny little anecdote to put in, but when you visit the villages, you went visit one village after another, everybody tells you that same story about pilots laughing out of the windows of the helicopters. And I think that that goes a bit beyond just doing your job. In a desperate attempt to recoup losses, farmers often sell plants or parts of plants that have not been directly hit by the poison, thus exposing users to dangerously contaminated cannabis. No environmental impact assessment has ever been carried out in the areas prior to the spraying. There is a feeling that these rural people are being taken for granted with the oversights in terms of environmental laws surrounding such an enclave of pristine biodiversity. These farmers have no recourse to the law, and this is where it becomes a human rights issue. Should the police arrive on the ground and arrest the farmers for cultivation and confiscate their crops as evidence. We as an organization, and South Africa in general, would be in a position to help the farmers in a court of law. Indiscriminate aerial spraying not only has the potential to damage, damage their health, that of their families, their animals, and their environment, it is also a serious violation of the human rights and equality before the law. The arbitrary nature of crop eradication leaves many on the ground in a state of bewilderment. One farmer asked why the government never came and sat down and explained to them why they are not allowed to grow cannabis. And you would think, us middle class whites going to the rural area, you just assume that the farmers on the ground know why cannabis is illegal and know why this is happening to them. And when I said to this one farmer, well, the government doesn't want you to grow cannabis because cannabis is bad for you. And he literally just laughed. He said, how can they say it's bad for you? I use it for myself. I use it for my animals. I sell it to pay school fees. What's, what's so bad about that? So the disconnect between the policymakers and the people in the rural areas who are most affected by this particularly awful practice is vast, 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 vast disconnect. It's very upsetting. Despite wide... That's the area uh, um, on the left there of the um, uh, Ponderland region that's been sprayed, the green areas there. The arbitrary nature... Hold on. Despite widespread media exposure and even mention in Parliament during 2015, we have no evidence that the South African police will not be back in a few weeks' time. This is a really urgent issue. I, I very much doubt whether we're going to be able to stop them coming back right now in a few weeks' time. Attorneys acting for several interested parties have sent a letter to the South African police force. And the reply that we got was that there's international laws that have to be adhered to implying that the United Nations conventions actually compel people to spray, uh, the, the police service to spray. And that's really unusual because Colombia, which had a long tradition of aerial spraying of their coastal bushes, saw a huge public outcry about the spraying. 
and they stopped spraying in 1999. And they're also signatories to the UN Single Conventions. So this is a bit of a lame excuse. So I've just gone through the list of most alarming things that we found on the ground. Now this is a list of the most alarming statements and opinions expressed by the South African authorities during our investigations last year, and this was in February uh, 2015. A document which is called A Perspective on the Aerial Spraying of the Illicit, illicit Cannabis Crop in the Trans Sky by Captain J.J.H. Reader, published in 2005, is the core document that the South African Police Services used to justify the ongoing operations. This is the document that the South African authorities are using as their environmental impact assessment. It's written by a police captain. It's not written by an environmental scientist. So how can it be used as the environment, environmental impact assessment? And I must say that in the Ponderland region, the, the local people are very, very aware of what is called an EIA. Doesn't matter how remote the, the village is that you go to, if you speak about an EIA, people know exactly what you're speaking about. Because the area has also been su uh, subject to quite a bit of mining exploration. Um, it is really, really... Uh, uh, an area that is threatened by unhealthy development. So this environmental impact assessment is a very serious issue. This document, the perspective on aerial spraying, is outdated in, in terms of its reference to the safety of glyphosate chemicals. And here we refer to the Institute of Science and Society special report entitled Why Glyphosate Should Be Banned. The South African authorities have made no effort to update their information in an age where the latest scientific studies are easily available. This study that they're using as the EIA was written in 2005, we're now in 2016. The World Health Organization has cited the International Agency for Research on Cancer as stating that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic to humans. Surely the authorities would err on the side of caution if it is probably carcinogenic to humans. And if the World Health Organization say that, then surely you should rather just hang on a bit. Let's just do a bit of more uh, investigation before we go uh, poisoning our citizens. On the left there is uh, the perspective on, on aerial spraying. A study for the product insert for Kilomax, the herbicide used in the 2015 spraying, shows that the most basic rules for the use of the product have been broken. There is no, sorry, the South African uh, authorities use the UN conventions to justify their actions, and they use the so-called safety of this uh, Kilomax product um, as a very thin smoke screen. For, for their actions. We expect that the helicopters will be back in the rural areas in the next few weeks. We've compiled a full report with the help of an environmentalist, an environmental attorney, and activists on the ground, and this is on the Fields of Green for All website. This is just, it's not a scientific report, it's a report from activists who've gone to go and see what, what happens. And, and then that report on the website has got all of the supporting documents, um, uh, including all of, the, all of the documents provided uh, for the so-called safety of the glyphosate. There are many aspects of cannabis prohibition that keep us up at night, but few are as dire and as urgent as forced crop eradication. We therefore, just to make a statement, demand that this practice is stopped immediately, or until such time as the authorities can provide the farmers on the ground with a comprehensive, independent environmental impact assessment. Fields of Green for All has been part of the Global Forum for Producers of Prohibited Plants for the last two years. We were honored to attend a gathering um, of all the members of this forum in Heemskirk in the Netherlands last month. Countries represented, and I think this is really interesting, so I'm going to tell you all the countries. 
Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, Indonesia, Myanmar, Albania, Morocco, Spain, and South Africa. 14 countries are all in all and 60 delegates um, uh, gathered at this forum in the small Dutch town and were all hold up, hold up in a 13th century castle for four days. We gathered to draw up a declaration of our demands as farmers and representatives of farmers of the opium poppy, the coca bush, and cannabis. And here I'd like to just make reference to Professor Julian Buchanan's uh, speech last night, for those of you that were here. Professor Buchanan made a very valid point when he spoke about drug apartheid and when he spoke about cannabis being singled out for legalization and liberalization and that all of the drugs should be treated equally. Why is cannabis special? Now, I couldn't agree more. So I'm going to read for you the Helmskirk Declaration and bear in mind that this was for all illicit crops. We're talking about plants here. That was the coca leaf, the opium poppy, and cannabis. There were 12 points that were drawn up by, by the members of the forum. We reject prohibition and the war on drugs. We demand the re removal of coca, cannabis, and opium poppy from the lists and articles in the 1961 UN Single Convention. We call for the elimination of all forms of forced eradication. We demand that all affected communities should be involved in all stages of drug policies and development, from the design to its implementation, monitoring, and, and, and evaluation. We have promised the farmers in Ponja land, and we hope to be able to extend that promise to other farmers that we, uh, that we visit in the future, that we will continue to shout. And that's why this, is, this point number four is really, really important. All affected communities should be involved. The farmers are very marginalized. And that's why, it was in, why I'm positive after having been to the Netherlands and met with all of the other farmers. That's why I'm positive about, about a drug policy change. Because at last, the farmers have the chance that their voices might just be heard. The conditioning of development assistance on prior eradication is unacceptable. The proper sequencing of development interventions is fundamental to its success. It often happens in rural areas that you have to eradicate your crop and then we'll give you some money and then we'll help you with development. But the condition is that you eradicate the, the illicit crops. Integrated sustainable development, isn't that UN speak? <laughs> should be the main intervention for crop-producing countries. Such development should promote and protect the livelihoods of small-scale farmers. The state and its institutions will need to assume responsibility to address the needs of the communities. We demand that the farmers and their families involved in the cultivation of these uh, uh, three crops should not be prosecuted by criminal law. Coca, cannabis and opium poppy and their use should not be criminalized. The expansion of the illicit markets of coca, cannabis, and opium poppy should become part of development strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not looking for alternative development in South Africa. We're looking for integrated development. We want to integrate our cannabis crop into a wide range of crops, into a wide range of, of in care of the environment and use of, use of the land. And then lastly, the farmers ended off with, we support the peace process in Colombia and Myanmar, which should be inclusive. And it was quite a sobering last point because when you speak to the Colombians and when you speak to the people from Myanmar and the Mexicans, you realize, wow, they have some stories to tell, that's for sure. So now just to end off, I want to give you a little a synopsis of what is happening with what I mentioned earlier called the trial of the plant. In 2010, myself and my partner were arrested in our home. The police knocked down our kitchen door at 2 o'clock in the morning searching for a drug lab. Uh, it was something that changed our lives forever. We've since given up our jobs in film and TV and become full-time cannabis activists. We had three choices when we were arrested. We could either accept our punishment 
and at absolute worst, that would mean seven to 10 years in jail, as we had quite a quantity of cannabis in our house. Our second option was, of course, this being South Africa to pay a bribe. <laughs> we even got a quote from a dodgy lawyer, and it would have cost us 40,000 Rand each, certainly much cheaper than this whole legalization uh, business. Our third option was actually to challenge the law. So we sued seven South African governments, government departments. That was five years ago, and it's been a long road, but we're getting there, and the trial of the plant is set to begin in the Pretoria High Court this year. We're thinking that the date is going to be somewhere between May and September. The trial of the plant, the evidence will be led across four platforms. It's very important that this process is, con is inclusive of all South Africans. That's why our organization is called Fields of Green for All. These four, four platforms are responsible adult use, which is the umbrella platform for all of the rest. Industrial use uh, and scientific use, otherwise known as hemp. Medical use, and most importantly, and alluding back to the plight of the farmers, traditional, cultural, and religious use. We're going to be calling eminent experts from all over the world. Each one of our international experts will be supported by a South African expert. And some of our South African experts are also international experts. Um, it's been um, a lot of hard work putting this together and, um, and actually convincing these people to come to South Africa. But these three eminent experts have, um, have agreed to, to come. At the top is Dr. Donald Abraham, and you'll just bear with me as I read you his credentials. Dr. Donald Abrahams is the Chief of Hematology Oncology Division at San Francisco General Hospital and a Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. He has an integrative on oncology consultation practice at the UCFS OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine. He was one of the original clinician investigators to recognize and define many early AIDS-related conditions. He has long been interested in clinical trials of complementary and alternative medicine interventions for HIV, AIDS, and cancer, including evaluations of medicinal cannabis. Dr. Abrahams has published 183 peer-reviewed studies, and his CV is 30 pages long. Our second eminent expert is Dr. Carl Hart. He is a neuropsychopharmacologist, say that fast, at Columbia University, New York. He conducts research and teaches both undergraduate and graduate courses in neuroscience, psychology, and pharmacology. Dr. Hart is a world-class scientist who has been awarded multiple grants to study the complex, complex in interactions between recreational drugs and the neurobiological and environmental factors that mediate human behavior and physiology. Professor David Nutt. His name has come up quite a few times during this conference, and I think Professor Buchanan was quoting him. Famous for being fired by the UK government for saying that taking ecstasy is safer than riding a horse, David Nutt is a British psychiatrist and neuropsychopharmacologist specializing in the research of drugs that affect the brain and conditions such as uh, addiction, anxiety, and sleep. His book, Drugs Without Hot, Hot Air, won the Transmission Prize for Communicating Science in 2014. In his book, he points out the harsh reality and that, and I quote, the government cannot think logically about drugs. Professor Nutt is our scale of harms expert and will show the court the glaring errors in the law when it comes to the perceived harms of cannabis. These three eminent academics will be joined by other experts who will cover each and every aspect of the government's justification for keeping cannabis illegal. By fighting these unjust laws in court, we are forcing lawmakers to take cognizance of the fact that history and nearly 100 years of moral judgment, not scientific fact, has shaped cannabis law in South Africa. The challenges that lie ahead are enormous, as all concerned need to work together to ensure the enforceability of new cannabis regulations, guarding against overregulation. Cannabis is indeed the gateway plant. And this brings me back to my comment about Professor Buchanan 
uh, lecture last night and this morning. Cannabis is the gateway plant to more just drug policy across the board for all drugs. We don't only want to single out cannabis, but right now it's taking all of our time and all of our effort and all our resources to concentrate on the cannabis plant as an organization. And we hope that our eminent experts who are going to be in South Africa to testify in the trial of the plant will be able to open the door and actually cover some ground. Dr. Carl Hart is certainly uh, not somebody who's only co concentrated on cannabis. Neither is, a professor, um, neither is Dr. Abrams and neither is Professor Nutt. So we're hoping to cover some ground that will lay the path for more sensible drug policy across the board. Our government needs to find the political will to introduce more uh, humane drug policy and certainly to start with fields of green for all. Thank you very much.